Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Anne Matuzowicz. I am a responsible investment strategist at Calvert Research and Management and director of the Calvert Institute for Responsible Investing. I'm joined by three of my colleagues, Dan Rourke and Helen are members of our ESG research analyst team, and Tangi is a member of our ESG quantitative research team. So we're excited to discuss some research that we've recently conducted around corporate governance. And I'm gonna leave my introduction very brief and just run through a series of questions for the panel around why we conducted this research, the, the research process and the findings. I encourage everyone to be engaged to utilize that Q&A chat function on the side if you have questions regarding specific points that were made directed at specific speakers, feel free to cite that individual and we'll be sure at the end to address those questions that you have. With that, I'm gonna start off with my first question directed to you, Dan. Um, can you tell us about why you conducted this research? What, what were you looking to accomplish and what were you looking to find? Yeah, thanks so much, Anne. Um, uh, my name is Dan Rourke and I, um, as Anne said, on the research team, I cover uh, communication services, which is a sector um, you know, with lots of uh, interesting and different governance challenges. So, um, one thing, you know, when we began this research, uh, governance is really core to what we do across all of our sectors at Calvert. And it's, it is because it's often a strong indicator of how well a company identifies and manages and takes advantage of uh, its environmental and social risks and opportunities. Um, the reason we wanted to do this is we found that some of the some of the ways that other uh, investors reported on or talked about um, uh, corporate governance didn't uh, sort of achieve a few goals that we had. And one was that we wanted to provide very meaningful insights for investors when they're making investment engagement decisions. We wanted to reduce what we thought was some observable country bias. And then we also wanted to, uh, very importantly, to capture the relationship between specific governance factors um, and financial materiality and corporate performance. So those were the reasons that we were we wanted to engage in this research in the first place. Thanks, Dan. Now, my next question, your research focuses on providing the country context to investors evaluating governance practices. How do you provide context in this research? And what is the foundation of, of how you went about grouping countries together? Um, thank you, Anne, and um, thank you for having us. So, um, so I think one of the inefficiencies that we found in terms of how um, we tend to look at governance from even an ESG perspective is that um, everybody tended to classify or look at it from a global perspective. So which meant that, um, say, developing countries were being looked at in the context of um, developed, their developed market and most likely um, really held up to the Western standards. So we really wanted to understand the country context, which we thought was important. And um, if you take a step back, the reason why you would need to understand um, country context is because um, if a country has, um, say, um, weak uh, practices, then um, it might lack the transparency or the infrastructure or the enforcement mechanisms to really um, reveal what's really going on underneath. And so um, what we did was that we created two indices, what we call our practices and our index and our rules index. So basically practices looked at um, the widespread observed governance actions. So these are things that people just tend to do um, just because of who they are, they are innate. And then rules, of course, looked at the observed legal framework within a um, company, within which companies operate. And for that, we use the OECD framework. And so with those two, then we were able to create um, a cluster, basically a grouping of four different, um, a group, a cluster of four different groups where we would know whether a country had high practices or sorry, strong practices or weak practices or um, um, strong practice, strong rules or um, weak rules. 
Thanks, Helen. And a follow up to that, when you think about these groupings, do you consider them static or is or do you anticipate some change over time to these groupings? Um, so I think what I would say is that rules, rules can be changed. Um, that's depending on the regulatory bodies within these countries, but then practices take a while to change. People really take a while to adapt to new practices. Um, and so we like to give an example of Japan. So, um, you know, Japan has been known for its uh, weak um, governance practices, but then since 2014, most recently in 2018, um, it enacted um, certain regulations that were put up to really address um, issues such as board effectiveness uh, through diversity. So they're encouraging more women to join boards and also encouraging uh, the independence of their advisory committees. So if you look at our grouping, we think of Japan as having weak practices and because of the rules that have been enacted, it falls under the strong rules. Uh, but what we hope to see is that if these rules are effective, then we hope to see Japan move into the quadrant of um, you know, strong practices, strong rules. However, rules are not always effective. So if this, um, the rules that have been put in place are not effective over time, then we'll continue to see Japan um, in the weak um, practices, um, strong rules quadrant. And I'm actually going to kind of take a step back reading one of the questions we've gotten it's about what KPIs do you consider when you talk about corporate governance? And I know when we kicked off this research, we were, I think it was over 90 metrics had been used to assess corporate governance. And what, you know, a goal of this research was to be more focused and really pull in that materiality bent to this so that we were looking at performance. But could I, any of you speak to the metrics or the, the governance factors that we're considering here. And I know we'll go into more detail around the testing tangy in a minute, but maybe what someone can speak just more generally to, to those factors that were assessed. Sure, and uh, Tangi, you can sort of step in in a moment, but we, we really looked at, um, we looked at, you know, about a hundred different indicators across what we bundled into uh, 10 different governance factors. Um, and we looked at those um, against financial performance, but I think Tanya can go into some of some more of that. We looked at MSCI. We were we used OECD as like a framework, and that was the sort of beginning of our evaluation. And just to add to that, so we tended to look at things such as accounting risk, audit oversight, board effectiveness, um, pay figures. Um, which were um, which are the ten pillars that we use to um, then um, create our our what our um, our rules and practices. So the next question is for Tangi. With the country clusters in place, how do you go about testing for financial materiality? Thank you, Anne. Um, we tested for financial materiality by regressing on financial performance. And specifically, we used multiple years of data and regressed the 10 um, governance factor, as Dan just mentioned, onto um, specifically return on asset, return on invested um, capital, price to book ratio, and price to equity ratio. And we did this for each cluster separately. And at the end, um, we also controlled for, during the regression, we also controlled for things like the year, um, the country, um, the industry, and the market cap to ensure that we're not introducing any bias into our regression. Great. So following up to that, what, what did you find when you were factors and what was material? Well, what we found was that there were between two to five um, material factors, depending on the cluster. Um, and we used those material factors to, we overweighted those material factors in the scoring calculations um, because we deemed them more important since they were tied to financial materiality. And um, there were two sub pillars that were broadly material. Those were ownership structures and um, accounting risk, 
Um, these were material in three out of, of the four clusters. Um, the other materials um, factors were more cluster dependent and very depending on what cluster you And this previously, but when you think about universal factors which versus factors that are more specific, Dan, maybe this is for you. How, how do you consider that when, when you're assessing companies and, and these factors? Yeah, absolutely. Um, at first, I just wanted to address a, a comment in the in the Q and A. One asked whether we were looking at non-listed companies. This first aspect of our research was just on unlisted companies. Um, you know, um, as Tanya mentioned, we uh, were we test we two of the ten factors that we tested were broadly material. That is accounting risk and ownership structure. In some ways, we thought this was pretty intuitive. Um, weak performance on fundamental issues of accounting control and control would be a flag for most investors. So, um, for example, our measure of accounting risk uh, identifies companies with anomalies in their financial reporting. So an example would be in their revenues, their expenses, asset liability valuations. Um, and these anomalies can signal problems with how a business is run or indicate uh, if there are potential problems in those internal controls. So um, it was interesting that we found this to be, you know, material um, pretty broadly. Similarly, um, weak performance on our ownership structure composite can be an indication of imbalances um, between share ownership and decision-making power. These imbalances pose a risk for minority shareholders who often have limited, um, limited control or recourse. We did find an exception in both cases. An accounting risk uh, was found not to be material in our weak practices, weak rules cluster. These are countries that have weaker enforcement mechanisms, um, which may result in cover-up or could be one reason why it is not the point of differentiation uh, that it is in our other country clusters. On the ownership structure uh, was found not to be material in strong practices, strong rules cluster. Investors in these countries tend to be protected by several layers. So they have strong practices, there are strong rules, there's adequate enforcement. So we think this is one of the reasons that um, ownership structure, though it's material elsewhere, is not material in our strong, strong cl cluster. into a little a little bit more can you talk more about that differentiation from between those four different clusters sure uh you know if we're talking about um the the you know we had the broadly material clusters but then we had sort of uh, two other groups of factors one was uh what we call governance basics so an example of this would be board independence something that you have to get right, you know, you have to have the right structure in place to start making the right decisions. Then our second um, cluster of factors, we really call governance quality. So unlike board independence, think of something like board effectiveness. Uh, you know, now that you have independence, you can start thinking about, do you have the right skills and talents to lead that business? Um, and uh, are, the, are those, is this board actually effective at its job? So we found, um, you know, th that to be a specific differentiation um, in the factors that we tested. Thank you. Question is for Helen. Can you tell us more about the difference between the two strong practices clusters specifically? Um. So the difference between uh, the two strong practices clusters is that if you, if a country has strong rules, then uh, what really sets them apart is board effectiveness and pay performance alignment. Um, if a company has weak rules, um, then we tend to, or the focus should really be on pay. So pay figures, um, what we call pay basics and quality. And so with the strong practices, strong rules, the reason why we need to focus on the quality of the board and the quality of the pay, and these are markets such as the US and the UK, 
is that majority of the time the board uh, the the board basics are, are ironed out, and quality is what really seems to separate um, leaders from laggards. Um, and as Dan just mentioned, so board effectiveness, which is material in this cluster, moves really beyond the basic measure of board independence and focuses on board expertise, skills, attendance, and entrenchment. And so just giving an example of the UK. So the UK recently just um, came up or released rules um, recently. And basically what it was with the UK corporate governance code, which was basically to try and include a stronger emphasis on culture, pay ratios and alignment of pay outcomes. So these are things you'll tend to see in the more um, developed markets, which fall under strong practices, strong rules. And so they are going beyond basics into the quality for the uh, pay practices, uh, sorry, for the strong practices and the weak rules, um, the focus is basically on pay. And these are countries such as Sweden and Singapore, where um, what we've seen is that um, these countries, um, people tend to trust. There's a, there's a certain high trust of uh, fellow citizens and um, institutions, even with the absence of, even with the absence of explicit rules. But then, however, due to the trust that is afforded to the boards in the absence of adequate rules, um, there tends to be a lack of checks and balances around pay. And so sound pay practices is really what will distinguish one country from another. Yeah. Great. So on, on the flip side of that, when you look at the weak practices, how, how do you think about that from an investor perspective? So the way we think about uh, weak practices, so for instance, the, in the weak practices and um, strong rules countries, these are countries such as Brazil and China. And if you take a step back, a um, country like Brazil has really seen a lot of scandals in the last couple of years. And so what we've seen is that they've tried to enact certain rules just to make sure that um, hopefully the practices change over time. And we've seen the same thing with China. So for these countries, you need to focus on the basic um, governance factors. So the policymakers have acted to improve the weak governance practices, uh, but those improvements have not yet been widely observable across firms and are likely to take time in this market. So investors should just focus on the basics first. And the basics by that I mean independence of board or just a clear respect for minority shareholder rights. Uh, for the weak practices, weak rules, and these are countries such as Mexico and South Korea, we need to focus on the pay basics. So South Korea is a good example where um, majority of the com uh, companies, or at least the large companies, are really ruled by Kaibols, which are large family-owned um, um, company, large family-owned um, companies. And so, what helped these companies actually rise up to power, which was um, you know, low interest loans or connections with government are really now um, kind of a disadvantage for these companies because um, because of the family control, they tend to um, have very low protection for uh, minority shareholders. And because of the governance, the, uh, the connections with uh, government, the government has not enacted rules to, um, to rein in this weak practices. So for these countries, um, without the adequate rules, um, and where enforcement is weak. What differentiates one company from another in this market is really the baseline measures of absolute pay, including disclosure. Thanks, Helen. And when I kind of bring this for every, this question for everyone, but were there any findings that were particularly stood out to you that you didn't expect to see or may have been um, conflicting with the previous view that you had? Yeah. Um, one thing, um, you know, we have been talking a little bit about board independence, and I think that's likely because when people talk about corporate governance, this is one of those things they focus on. Um, I mean, we found it to, we only found evidence of materiality in one of our clusters. That was the strong practices, weak rules cluster. So um, you're thinking this is, you know, Brazil, China, Hong Kong, India, Japan, um, this is a place where you really, um, you know, governments have acted uh, to put in place stronger rules. 
um, but the practices uh, are still getting up to speed. So you really want to focus on those basics. So I think I expected that to be material in more of our clusters. I also just, I saw there was like two questions in the Q&A. One is about sharing the results and, um, you know, we, we will be publishing a paper out on this uh, um, at some point on our website soon. Um, and then also on how do we quantify board quality or effectiveness? We basically, I think this is one thing we, we didn't quite uh, get to in the beginning, but each one of our 10 factors is basically a basket of indicators that we think uh, relate to that overall issue. So on the quality issue, it's it really is looking you know, at the expertise of the different people on the board um, and uh, also on, um, you know, things like, are they uh, entrenched in there for a long time? So hopefully that helps clarify things a little bit. Thanks, Dan. And then I have a question. I'm going to put this to Tangi. When you looked at these assessments and eventually using them in the investment decision-making process, how did you test for any biases before implementing this information? Right. And as I mentioned before, um, when we were calculating the regressions, we did control for um, various variables to ensure that we didn't introduce any bias. But when we tested it, what we did is we looked at the distributions of different subgroups. And we wanted to ensure that basically it will not be very different, or actually it should be very similar for each subgroup. And that was one of the issues when we did not include um, any clusters, country clusters, or materiality, what we found was that um, the governance scores were more biased towards some companies than, or some countries than others. But after um, this new methodology incorporating these new factors, um, we found that all of the subgroups, so for example, between clusters, um, the scores look very similar for um, the the data set of that cluster. We check at the countries within an individual cluster to make sure that um, one country wasn't getting, for example, all the high scores and one country was getting all the low scores because that would show that um, basically the country was assigned to a one cluster, so we verified for that. Um, we also looked at scores versus, versus market caps to make sure that for example, there is no trend showing that as you go up in market cap, you're more likely to have a higher or lower score. Um, and we also looked at the scores by the sectors to ensure that everything had very similar um, distributions. Great, thank you. And I think that's the list of questions that I had for the speakers. If there are any other points that you'd like to make or anything else, um, and then we can see if there are any other questions from the audience that we'd like to address. It looks like we have a question around the, this scoring versus scoring from some of the data providers, MSCI, Asset4. How would you say this scoring is differentiated from those methodologies? Um, I can start uh, if that's helpful. Um, you know, in assessing, you know, some of these other uh, data sets, we really did observe a lot of country bias. You know, sometimes it was uh, bias against North American companies, um, partly because there's a lot of reporting and enforcement. Sometimes it was uh, toward emerging market companies um, because of where they were domiciled. So that was really a driving force behind uh, where we started. We wanted both um, we found is there's likely investment opportunities in most places. It's just you have to know what to focus on. And that changed our, uh, what this research does is it doesn't even only focus our investment decisions, but also our engagement decisions. You know, what do we care about when we're uh, talking to a company about corporate governance that is domiciled in a particular place? Um, so I think, you know, this, uh, this research, it was very much, uh, theoretical and it's starting, but then we quickly focused on how it can be used and what the practical experience is of our investment teams and research teams. Thanks, Dan. Oh, go ahead, Helen. Yeah, I think 
Yeah, the one thing I think I'd like to add to is that um, so the data vendors usually, or like MSCI usually apply a particular discount for um, certain flags within um, companies. So they might apply a high um, discount for say audit concerns for a particular company, but we're not able to glean into why um, the discounts are what they are. And so I think one of the positive things about this is that um, the discounts that we apply and everything that we put in is really based on materiality. So what we did was that issues that were material um, tended to um, tended to account for um, two thirds of the score. And then that way, then you're able to really differentiate the leaders from the laggards. Um, and as Dan mentioned too, when um, most of this uh, data vendors look at they look at companies from a global perspective, but even when they look at them from um, a regional perspective, it's usually the typical regions, emerging markets or um, developed markets. So we felt that it does not make sense to really say group all emerging markets or look at them in one lens. So for instance, South Africa is one country that falls under the strong rules, strong practices. And that's because generally, had really strong corporate governance um, rules in place and practices, even though some of you might argue that those are not uh, being enacted maybe in the right way in the last couple of years. But um, so it wouldn't be fair to group a country like that with um, other emerging markets that um, tend to be in the say um, weak practices area. So I think that this just gives us an additional layer and uh, transparency as to why we think of the countries the way we do. And then um, as Dan mentioned, then adds on um, a performance um, lens to it, making it, um, making it, you know, cementing the financial materiality. Everybody talks about financial materiality, but in this case, I think based on the research, then we really are looking at this from a financially material angle. Thank you, Helen. And I was just noting that the, the paper is available on the Grassby site, so you should be able to, to find it there and um, download it next to the description of the event. But um, we'll do a kind of a last call for questions, and, and if we don't have anything else, I think we can, can wrap it up. Um, so I want to thank my team here uh, for their great work. It's definitely very interesting and exciting stuff. I think there's so much research to be done and it's certainly a, a growing space where we're trying to determine what is most relevant as the data proliferation continues so it's it's definitely something that's adding value and we you know encourage everyone to engage ask questions continue the conversation if there is uh, anything else we want to discuss but with that i think i think we'll wrap it up so th thank you everyone for your time and thank you participants and Thank you to the conference organizers for putting this together. It's, it's been a great, great experience. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.